All right. Welcome, everybody, uh, and a happy Halloween. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight. Um, this is a public lecture hosted by KAIPAC, um, the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. My name is Sinan Du. Uh, I am the KAIPAC Outreach and Engagement Manager, and I will also be your main host today. Um, I would like to say a big thank you uh, for all of you for coming to join us tonight, especially given uh, it's also on the night of Halloween. Um, we understand that this is not the most convenient time for hosting a public lecture, um, simply because we also didn't have better options because of the room availability. And as you can see, that we're also running into some small technical uh, problems. But we still hope that you get to enjoy today's event with a slightly different taste um, also where you can see around the room and um, from our speaker, um, a little bit of taste of Halloween and that makes it uh, you know, special. Um, before we get started, I would like to uh, give a big thank you to all the team that's working behind the scene to actually support our event. Um, some of you might have already um, you know, met our front desk staff, and we also have our tech team supporting us here. Um, and we actually have um, chat moderators online who is um, answering questions on YouTube. So now we'll um, quickly introduce them and also let them to say hi. So to start with, we have Shay. Hey everybody, I'm Shay. Uh, I am an early career research scientist in the Stanford Solar Physics Department. And so I'll be answering some questions today. Thank you, Shay, and great look. Um, next we have Everett. Hello everyone, I'm Everett MacArthur. I'm a post-bachelor um, at Stanford KIPAC. I do research in galaxies. Awesome. And last but not least, we have Sagaf. Sagaf, you might be muted. All right. Sorry. Hi. Hello. My name is Sagaf Kadir. I'm a Stanford graduate student um, in the physics department, uh, and I'm a 3D graduate student, and I do some of my research particle physics, but I also uh, live and work at the Wilcox Solar Observatory. Wonderful. So um, all these online chat moderators, they are subject matter um, experts on this topic, and they will be answering most of the questions online as they come in. Um, and the remaining questions will be saved for Sushant to answer during the Q&A session. And for those of you who are in person, um, you'll get to ask any kind of questions during the Q&A. And of course, Sushant will be staying even after the event for any kind of in-depth conversations that you want to have. Um, so, well, now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, Dr. Sushant Mahajan, um, our star of the night, pun intended. Um, so Sushant um, is a postdoctoral fellow here at Stanford working in the solar group and also the Hansen Experimental Physics Lab. Um, he got his PhD um, in 2019 from Georgia State University, and before joining Stanford in 2022, he actually spent two years in Maui um, at University of Hawaii as a postdoc. Probably one of the best places that you could do a postdoc. Yeah. Um, so his research interest um, is focused on actually understanding and characterizing the um, interactions between magnetic fields and also plasma flows which you will um, all be learning more about tonight. So without further ado, I will turn the stage to you, Sushant. Oh, thanks so much, John. Everybody in the back room. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me here, and I thank um, Kaipak as well for giving me this opportunity to engage with you all. Um, on Halloween night, you might see some references to Halloween <laughs> Uh, Janan has worked really hard on um, making this possible and also organizing the eclipse event that we had two, two weeks ago. So let me let me first begin 
by discussing the scales. Here's a family picture of our solar system. Uh, and the largest ones right there, see in the sun. Uh, for, for scale, look at Jupiter here hanging around. And that teeny tiny bit is, is our Earth. The Earth, uh, Jupiter is about 11 times the size of the Earth when you compare the diameters. And the sun is about 10 Jupiters in, in diameter. Uh, this is just in linear scale. But if you think of the sun as your Halloween candy basket, and you open it and you start to stuff Earth-sized candies into this basket, you can fit 333,000 Earths into, into the sun. So those are the scales that we're going to be talking about today. And uh, we'll start by looking at uh, the sun's features, how the sun looks in different kinds of lights. Uh, here is a picture of the sun in extreme ultraviolet light. Can you, can you make out a pattern over there? Looks like a carved pumpkin, right? <laughs> There's your first Halloween reference. So, um, so far we know that the sun produces energy through nuclear fusion in its core and the core stretches up to about 25% of the solar radius from the center. The center of the sun is about 15 million kelvins hot. That's what allows hydrogen fusion to occur. Um, then you get into the radiative zone, which stretches from 25% of the solar radius up to about 70% of the solar radius. This is a region where the heat produced inside the core of the sun travels in the form of light, in the form of radiation. Um, up to this distance of 70% of the solar radius. But once you get here, uh, radiative transfer, as in transfer of heat in the form of light, is no longer the most efficient mode of transferring heat. It is convection. And convection is something that we come across in our daily lives. When you uh, put a pot of water on, on, on your gas stove, uh, for some time it doesn't really do much. But after a while, you can notice some circulation patterns start to start to happen. The water starts to move slowly. And then later, you don't even need to look at it. You can just tell by your ears, it starts making sounds. And that's where, when your water is boiling. What happens there is, is convection currents set in, as in uh, water retains some heat from the bottom of the pan. It expands as it gets hotter and it rises up to the surface, releases some of its energy, becomes cooler and hence denser, and sinks back down to gather more energy from the bottom. Those are convection uh, cells, hotter uh, water rising up, colder water going down. And um, when this process happens in, in, in uh, environments where there is a really high gradient of heat, uh, difference between the hot and cold parts, this process can become turbulent um, as, well, I can, that's the sound of turbulence when, when uh, fluids move very fast. And so the sun's convection zone, this last 30% of the sun is turbulently convective. So plasma is uh, moving heat away from the bottom of the convection zone to the surface. And in the process, it is also creating sound waves inside the sun which we actually use to study the interior parts of the sun. Apart from that, at the surface, you have, we see sunspots um, and um, prominences uh, in the atmosphere of the sun. One of the really cool things about the sun is at the surface, the temperature is about 6,000 kelvins. And then if you move away from the surface, it is like moving away from fire. Uh, the temperature drops for a, a, a couple of thousand kilometers. Uh, it goes from 6,000 kelvins near the surface to 4,500. And then as you step a little bit farther away in a span of 200 kilometers, the temperature shoots back up to 1 million kelvins. And then it stays like that in the sun's um, higher atmosphere, which we call the corona. Now, this is one of the mysteries of the sun that we are yet to sufficiently explain as to why the solar corona is so hot. Uh, some features that we can make out just by visible light, if you were to look at a really good close-up of the sun, 
is a granulation pattern. This um, is a direct result of convection, um, as in uh, the brighter patches, the brighter yellows are hotter, is hotter plasma rising up to the surface. And the uh, intergranular lanes, the, the boundaries of these uh, bright faces, uh, which are dark in color, that's colder, denser plasma going uh, sinking back down. And we see sunspots over here. This is uh, these are images from the world's largest solar telescope, which is on Maui, uh, the deepest um, solar telescope. <clears throat> but if you look at the sun in extreme ultraviolet light, which we cannot see, but we can detect with spacecraft like the Solar Dynamics Observatory, you see a whole host of things. The sun is really, really dynamic and it comes to light really well when you look at it in extreme ultraviolet lights. You can see really large features like this filament over here, which seems to suspend in the atmosphere of the sun. It is truly a feature that hangs above the surface of the sun and it's suspended by magnetic fields. These filaments can stretch for longer distances than a sun's radius. Um, and they also uh, have dynamics associated with them. As in, you'll see a filament appear here um, on, on the top left, and um, it will look like it, it'll just disappear. It'll emerge um, away from the sun, changing the whole uh, topology of features around it. <clears throat> and slow down and look at that filament now. We're here we're looking at a close-up of a filament and you'll see it burst out. There we go. And it changes, it creates a disturbance around it. <clears throat> so a lot of interesting phenomena um, are visible on the sun when you look at extreme ultraviolet lights. Um, are we taking questions uh, within the talk? Or, okay, uh, I, I'll come to your question right after. <clears throat> the other thing that we can see is uh, these really bright regions, which are actually interestingly um, associated with sunspots. Now sunspots in visible light, they appear to be dark because uh, of the presence of a lot of magnetic field. The magnetic field pushes some of the hot plasma away, making the interior of a sunspot appear a little darker because it's less hotter than the surrounding regions. But when you look at um, ultraviolet light, uh, this, the, the sunspot regions actually appear to be brighter than the surroundings. And that is because um, there is a lot of non-thermal emission that is associated with magnetic fields. Uh, some uh, positive negative magnetic fields uh, can cancel each other to create these high energy um, emissions, uh, which emit uh, light in the form of extreme ultraviolet and X-ray uh, radiation around sunspot regions. All right, um, then we have some really transient uh, events on the sun. On the left um, is an example of a solar flare. A solar flare is essentially um, uh, energy of the order of millions of atomic bombs being released in a couple of seconds. Uh, it's, uh, these are the most explosive events in our solar system. And uh, it, because it releases a lot of X-rays, we're concerned um, with those when we send astronauts into space. <clears throat> uh, then sometimes along with the solar flare, you would also um, have a coronal mass ejection, which is essentially kind of like a burp given out uh, by the sun. It's really hot uh, plasma. 1 million kelvins in temperature um, that is just burped by the sun and it can travel in any direction, sometimes even towards the earth. <clears throat> Here is an example of a coronal mass ejection. The sun is in, in the white circle over here um, and uh, a NASA spacecraft uh, took, took this time lapse of an image. There's the coronal mass ejection um, going to the top left. And these can uh, be ejected at the speed of a thousand kilometers per second. So um, let's uh, uh, look at a particular event. 
the, uh, of the most, um, sorry, let me start again. Uh, back in the old days, in, in 1850s, 1860s, astronomers didn't have a consistent source of funding. Uh, it was usually the rich people who owned their own houses, who built, uh, who built telescopes as parts of their houses, like, like this house here that belonged to uh, Richard Carrington in, in England. In 1859, he was, he was looking through his uh, solar telescope, and he was actually projecting uh, the sun onto um, a board on which he, he would trace out the diagrams of uh, how sunspots looked. And this is one such diagram from September uh, 1859 when he was tracing this sunspot region and how it looked like. He suddenly saw uh, these white regions labeled A, B, C, and D uh, go really bright. This was one of the first like um, uh, detections of, of flare. And as soon as he saw this uh, sudden brightening in these regions, he actually ran away to find someone <laughs> so that he can show it to them. But by the time he came back, he said the event was had become really feeble, really weak, and he wishes he, he had stayed there and watched how it evolved. Um, 18 hours later, miners in Colorado woke up at 3 a.m. thinking that it was morning and started preparing breakfast. The light that they were seeing in the night sky was not the sun. It was actually aurora caused by this um, event, which we now call uh, the Carrington event. It is the strongest uh, event recorded in history, uh, corresponding to the strongest flare. And there was a coronal mass ejection. But we speculate that there was a coronal mass ejection associated with this event that traveled towards the Earth and caused northern lights. Now, how, how does that work? How, how does uh, coronal mass ejection create geomagnetic storms on Earth and create aurora. Here is a demonstration. Uh, this right there, the tiny little blue dot is, is the Earth. And these blue lines represent the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, it, the magnetic field of the Earth is kind of squished on the side that faces the sun. So the sun is to the left. And it, it uh, curves around and has this really long tail, which we call the magneto tail. On, on the other side, um, facing opposite to the sun. Uh, what happens during a coronal mass ejection is uh, the sun sends out these this massive lump of charged particles, which have their own magnetic field, and they interact with the Earth's magnetic field. They can uh, reconnect some of the field lines uh, over here and press on the field lines in the magneto tail, as you will see in this animation. So here's the front coming from the sun. It reconnects some of the field lines, presses on the magneto tail. And when the magneto tail reconfigures, reconnects, you will see a bunch of plasma particles go towards the north and south poles of the Earth. And when they collide with air in the north and south, uh, uh, south pole regions, it excites oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the air. All these charged particles give their excess energy to oxygen and nitrogen. And when oxygen and nitrogen try to go back to their ground state, they release this energy in the form of green and red light, which is what causes uh, aurora. All right. <clears throat> so these events, which are powered by the sun, solar flares, coronal mass ejections, they alter the environment in space and also called geomagnetic storms, uh, which are associated with northern lights. All these effects, we, we call them space weather. It, uh, and what we try to do as a community is just like we have weather prediction on the Earth, we're trying to predict weather in space, which is related to all these events. And how does that impact life on Earth? Well, the most beautiful thing is it causes auroras, but it also interferes with our satellites. And one of the most important ones we use is the constellation of GPS satellites. Um, during uh, these kind of events, during geomagnetic storms, uh, GPS satellites can, can lose some of their accuracy. The uh, blue dot that you see on Google Maps 
um, shows you a, a dark blue dot with your location and a lighter blue, a bigger circle with the uncertainty in your location. That uncertainty can grow um, during uh, such events. Some satellites might even go out of communication. <clears throat> then uh, in the uh, northern and southern polar regions, if you have a flight passing through that area, which a lot of transcontinental flights uh, do, as in a flight direct between New York and Mumbai in India, uh, that would pass very close to the North Pole to save fuel because that's the shortest route. If you are in the Northern Polar region during an event like this, your plane could completely lose communication because of charges and currents in the atmosphere. It causes radio frequency blackouts. <clears throat> Satellites are affected a lot of times when uh, really strong um, events are predicted. Uh, the military uh, puts some of their satellites into sleep mode uh, for the duration of the event. And of course, astronauts out in space can be um, susceptible to exposure to a lot of X-ray radiation. This will especially be important when we send people back to the moon and uh, to camp out on Mars in a few years, because they will be exposed to this radiation for prolonged events, of, uh, prolonged times. And uh, we need to get to a point when we can predict these events at least 24 hours in advance so that we can uh, issue them um, uh, these predictions and tell them not to leave out of their campsites on those, uh, during those particular times. Here's um, an example of a geomagnetic storm. This was particularly strong, but not close to the Carrington event. We have never had anything um, close to the Carrington event since. Uh, 1859, uh, but this was um, kind of strong. It, uh, what it did was it uh, created a lot of induced currents in the Earth's atmosphere. And those induced currents found a weak point in the electric grid of uh, Quebec. And um, uh, Quebec, one city, I don't exactly recall which city in Quebec, but um, uh, one city in Quebec was out of power for about 18 hours and they had to borrow electricity from New York. Um, so these events kind of affect any uh, electrical grid or any kind of metal structure that's, uh, that stretches over long distances. And the map that you see here are the electric grids in US and Canada. The orange uh, grid is the Western grid. The, um, blue grid is the central and um, eastern grid. Texas has its own grid and there's uh, Quebec. <clears throat> so you can see everywhere T is marked, uh, electric power was stripped and this D is where transformers were damaged. And transformers are not something that you can buy off the shelf and replace. You have to build them on site. These are very big bulky components. So if today, um, a Carrington level event happens, these Ds will be spread out all over the US um, and Canada and many other nations too. Uh, we could, some uh, areas of the US could be out of power for months together. It is really important to be able to predict at least those largest events. All right, so what kind of outstanding questions do we have? From an operational point of view, uh, we want to know what powers solar eruptive events like solar flares, coronal mass ejections, uh, which create geomagnetic storms. Uh, can we predict these events reliably? Um, and the scientific questions are, where inside the sun is magnetic field produced? Because magnetic field is inherently linked to a lot of these uh, activities. And how um, are sunspots created? And also, why is the corona so hot? All right, um, this is a picture of a total solar eclipse from um, a scene from Argentina in 2020. Uh, you can kind of make out a lot of filamentary patterns. These are essentially magnetic field lines of the sun around which a lot of bright plasma is, is trapped. And it is a spectacular, experience to see a total solar eclipse. And a total solar eclipse is going to be visible 
from the US in April of 2024. So if you have the chance, I would really recommend traveling to a location where you can see the totality, where the sun looks like this, instead of just a partial eclipse, kind of like what we had two weeks ago. I hope a lot of you had a chance to see that. All right, um, let's look at uh, how ma magnetic fields look. So in magnetic fields were discovered on the sun by George Hale in 1908 in a 150 foot solar tower near Pasadena. Uh, what he looked at was the light coming from sunspots, especially um, it, it, instead of um, getting one particular color of light that he was looking at, he got three different colors of light that, that one color split into three, which tends to happen in the presence of magnetic fields. And that is how magnetic field was detected on the sun for the first time. Now, magnetic fields have this interesting property. Um, don't look at this equation here. We, we, calculus was invented to explain physical phenomenon, right? So every equation kind of has a geometrical interpretation. So you don't need to be bothered with equations as much. The geometrical interpretation of this equation is magnetic field lines are always closed. You never have an open magnetic field line, right? Kind of like uh, the magnetic field lines of bar magnets, which always have a north and south pole, which you might have uh, seen in um, school. Kind of like that, every sunspot, because uh, it has a magnetic field associated with it, all sunspots appear in pairs. There's a north polarity sunspot and a south polarity sunspot. And magnetic field lines connect the two in the atmosphere, and they're expected to connect even inside the sun. But all the loops that you've seen in movies uh, I've shown so far, all the loops that extend outside the sun, these are all magnetic field lines. And there's some hot plasma trapped along those magnetic field lines that creates these uh, stunning images. And sunspot numbers, the, if you count the number of sunspots, and we've been doing that for the last 413 years, ever since Galileo started recording them, Sunspot numbers vary in time and they vary in cycles of 11 years. You'll see the number of sunspots in the sun grow for seven years and decay for, for about, uh, sorry, grow for four years and decay for about seven years uh, following that uh, maximum. And this maximum inactivity is, is very variable as well. Uh, from, from cycle to cycle. Right now, we're in kind of a low activity period here. Um, and this number of sunspots is also related to the magnetic field of the sun. Here, the color represents the magnetic field. Uh, yellow is negative magnetic field, that's south polarity. And uh, blue is positive magnetic field. And this line corresponds to the north pole of the sun. And here is the south pole of the sun in time. And you can see the magnetic field of the sun flip from cycle to cycle. And all these regions correspond to uh, locations where sunspots are present. <clears throat> so there is, there is a lot of uh, intricate uh, link between the number of sunspots and the switching of, of magnetic fields on the sun. Sunspots also correlate with eruptions. Um, here, is the number of sunspots varying as a function of year. And here is the number of uh, C-class flares, which are particularly weak flares, and X-class flares, which are the strongest category of flares that we have. These number of, the number of these flares are directly related to the number of sunspots present. So if you want to um, uh, predict the long-term behavior of the sun, as to what the next 11 years are going to look like from a space weather point of view, how many flares you would have, it would be uh, 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 predicting the sunspot number would be a good way to, to go about predicting how many flares you would have. <clears throat> um, now to understand the behavior of sunspots and how they evolve, what we also do is look at how flows inside the sun evolve. Um, you can probe uh, the interior of the sun by looking at how sound waves uh, propagate on the sun. Uh, what you have on the sun is this, the sun's surface acts as a reflective boundary for sound waves. So the, if you look at this red wave in particular, it reflects from the surface, goes inside the sun, comes back up, reflects from the surface. 
And the deeper a sound wave goes, the less number of times it will reflect from the surface. We use these properties of propagation of sound waves inside the sun to um, infer uh, what, the, uh, what the sun looks like inside and how uh, plasma inside the sun moves with time. This technique is called helioseismology. <clears throat> All right, so there are two major components of flows in, uh, in the sun. Um, the sun's equator, because the sun is not a rigid body like the earth, it's a, instead it's a hot uh, uh, ball, a giant ball of gas, it doesn't rotate like a solid body. It rotates differently at different, um, uh, in different regions. The equator of the sun rotates once about uh, 25 days around itself, while the uh, polar regions of the sun rotate once about 35 days around themselves. So there's slow rotation near the poles and fast rotation near the equator. And this rotation rate not only uh, varies with, with latitude, but it also varies with depth inside the sun. Um, here, this uh, red dotted line is the 70% uh, radius of the sun boundary. And it, you can see inside the sun, as you go from the surface here to the inside, the rotation rate is changing as well. Right? The other uh, kind of flow is a meridional flow, as in uh, there is a flow that goes from equator towards the poles of the surface, and it comes back down towards the equator. This is kind of like a conveyor belt. Uh, <clears throat> now, how do these flows contribute to what we see on, on the surface of the sun? If you start with a magnetic field inside the sun, kind of like a dipolar magnet, positive magnetic field coming out of the sun, negative magnetic field going into the sun, and you have differential rotation, as if the equator is rotating faster than the higher latitudes, what it tends to do is um, it starts uh, curving around these magnetic fields. It starts pushing this lower latitude magnetic field and wrapping it around the sun because magnetic field, the plasma parameters inside the sun are such that the magnetic field moves with the plasma. <clears throat> and once you've uh, wrapped the field around the sun in this process, the field is also amplified. When it becomes strong enough, uh, because magnetic field, uh, when in presence of magnetic field, magnetic field will push some of the hot plasma out. The density inside this region of high magnetic field will be lower. Than, than outside and it rises up to the surface. It pierces the, the sun's surface in two locations, forming a pair of sunspots here. That's how we, we, we currently explain the formation of sunspots. But this all of this process, it's, it's very um, indirectly inferred. We don't have clear direct observations of this. This was a theory that was proposed by uh, Eugene Parker back in 1955. <laughs> And we have a group here um, uh, based at Stanford, uh, but with a lot of partner institutions all over the US. Uh, it's a NASA drive science center called COFFEES, Consequ Consequences of Flows and Fields in the Interior and Exterior of the Sun, uh, which studies every aspect of the sun's internal workings. Now, the magnetic field, when, when you create magnetic field, Due to shearing motions of plasma flows, magnetic field, when it's created, has uh, there's a simple law called Lenz's law of electrodynamics, um, uh, which says the created magnetic field will oppose the mechanism that created it in the first place. And so magnetic fields also um, have effects on changing the rotational velocity of, of the sun. Uh, the red patterns here are places where the flow accelerates in time. The green patches here are flow where uh, locations where the plasma decelerates in time. And uh, you have an 11 year cycle in the flows of the sun um, in um, sync with the magnetic cycle. And similar for flows in the north south direction, we also have an 11 year period in the north south flows um, in sync with the sunspot number. All right, um, here, here's some work that I did during my PhD, which um, 
shows the interior of the sun. This is 0.76 solar radius. So this is 76% of the solar radius away from the center, um, which shows acceleration here and deceleration here in rotation rate that is correlated with when the cycle activity um, increases, when the sunspot number increases. This, I think, is indirect evidence of uh, the um, notion that shearing differential rotation inside the sun creates the sunspot cycle, uh, but it's yet to be confirmed by others. All right, the other thing that you can do with helioseismology is helioseismology, which is the study of sound waves in the solar interior. You can see through the sun to the, to the far side, which is not facing us. Um, and here is an illustration of that. So this yellow part of the sun is facing towards us. We can see this, but we can also detect sunspots on the other side of the sun, uh, which is not facing us through helioseismic techniques. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we can come to the last part of this talk, uh, which is forecasting. What do, what do we need to forecast? We need forecast for solar flares, coronal mass ejections, uh, SEPs are solar energetic particle events, it's a burst of energy particles. For long-term uh, planning, we need uh, predictions of the sunspot cycle amplitude, as in how strong the next cycle will be, we, because it is correlated to the number of eruptive events during the next cycle. And we also need um, predictions of the total solar irrad irradiance, which is the total energy output of the sun. This is used as an essential input for climate models, for the models that, uh, that are being used for studying climate change. Um, and here's the part again, which shows the correlation between the sunspot number and the number of eruptive events, as well as the total solar irradiance. Here it is. <clears throat> but how good are we at predicting these things? So for the long-term sunspot number, here is a range of predictions. I, I would not encourage you to read anything here. It's a, it's a mess, um, but just look at the range of predictions. People predicted from the smallest cycle we've ever observed to the largest magnitude of cycle we've ever observed for solar cycle 24, which was from um, 1995, up to 2006, um, seven. But the act, but actually the cycle magnitude turned out to be this line, right? Um, so we are, I, I like to say, we are in um, a field that is kind of, um, you can say about 30 years behind weather prediction, normal weather prediction. Um, but, and this is not just proof that we are failing at predicting the cycle it's proof that we are trying several ways, right? <clears throat> uh, in terms of the short-term predictions um, as well, uh, there are uh, problems with uh, predicting flares uh, within 24 hours or coronal mass ejections within 24 hours. Um, and the, essentially the crux of the problem is that it is a highly imbalanced data set that you're using because flares happen kind of rarely. If you give uh, the flare data to, let's say a machine learning model and flares are only happening 0.1% of the time, the machine learning model could always predict no and still be 99.9% .9 right, right? It, it's useless, but it's accurate. Uh, <laughs> so we need to improve on that. Uh, the, the problem with such class imbalance data sets is to come up with a, with a good skill score, a good um, metric of judging how good the model is. <clears throat> and how do we catch up to the weather forecast we're using by leveraging AI? Um, over here is the QR code to a, a, a data set that we created at Georgia State University, uh, which enables anybody who doesn't have a solar physics background to use solar data uh, to uh, be able to predict or to develop uh, algorithms to predict solar flares. 
And uh, we're hoping we can leverage AI to cover that 30 years of gap between us and weather modelers uh, really quickly. And here's one example. Uh, some of the figures that I've used in this presentation, they were created by DAL E3, which is um, one of the uh, machine learning engines created by OpenAI. I just told it to um, create northern lights on a Halloween night. <clears throat> Here is uh, uh, here are all the missions, uh, just to kind of give you a feel uh, uh, that are related to uh, the NASA Solar Physics uh, or Heliophysics System Observatory. These are all the different kinds of missions that all study uh, something about the sun, and and some of them also study the Earth's magnetic field and its response to things happening on the sun. Um, we're looking forward uh, to to a lot of new missions as well. Uh, the, the new missions are here in, in orange, like PUNCH, um, IMAP, GLIDE, uh, which, which are upcoming. Uh, here is SDO. This is the mission uh, that most uh, images I, I showed today come from. Uh, this is a collaboration between Stanford, uh, NASA, Lockheed Martin, and um, University of Colorado in Boulder. And it gives us about one and a half terabytes of data every day since 2010, uh, creating the largest astrophysical database we have, uh, at least we had until last year. And all of that data, interestingly, is stored in the building next door in the physics and astrophysics building, the basement. Um, the one thing that is missing from this, which would be a big deal, and as a, the heliophysics community, we are uh, pushing to make that happen is a constellation of four to five satellites all around the sun, because our capabilities right now are really limited to the part of the sun that we can see. And even um, the half of the sun we can see, the measurements are really unreliable on the limbs, the north, south pole, and on the, uh, around the edges. So it's really only 30, 40% of the sun that we can use. We need to have a constellation of satellites all around the sun to, to be able to look at the sun as a whole um, for, for a lot of our um, models and predictions to, to be improved. Um, here is another QR code, um, uh, which will point you to a YouTube movie. It's five or six minutes long, so I'd recommend you not watch it right now, um, but you can, Scan it and pause it. It'll be in your YouTube uh, history. You can you can look at it later when you, when you go home. But it is about uh, Halloween's the geomagnetic storm that happened exactly on Halloween 20 years ago from, from today in 2003, um, and it created uh, really strong uh, northern lights, uh, which were which were visible from most of the U.S. <clears throat> Thank you, and I'll have your questions. Well, thank you very much uh, for such a great lecture, Sushant. Um, okay, so uh, let me just brighten up the light and we will uh, start taking questions from the audience. Right over there. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, your work, is it mainly observational? Or uh, let's say, have you do modeling? Is there some maybe uh, you know? I, I, I assume you can't recreate plasma yet, but is there any other types of avenues of research as mainly observational or analyzing? Maybe we can talk a bit about that. Uh, uh, you know. right. Um, th thank you. Yes, let me quickly repeat that so that everyone can hear. Um, so in terms of your own research, uh, do you mainly do observational uh, things? You also mentioned AI, right? So did you do any kind of simulation or using machine learning to study any of the things that you have just mentioned? Yeah, uh, so as an undergrad, I started with simulations of the interior of the sun and how magnetic field is produced. And in grad school, I kind of applied what I learned from the simulations to look for the signs of the magnetic fields inside the sun in observations. And I, I think I found them <laughs> in my dissertation, uh, but we'll see about that. 
Um, one of the things that I also did during my PhD was uh, collaborate with a lot of computer scientists at Georgia State. We have this um, um, lab called the Data Mining Lab, where uh, we collaborated with eight computer science PhD students who were doing their PhDs in machine learning, but they were all working on solar data. So myself and my PhD advisor, we were kind of their uh, consultants for, for solar physics to, to help them understand what magnetic fields are, what data they're looking at. Um, and uh, the role that I played in there was to create a curated data set um, that is machine learning ready. Because uh, a lot of cleaning and pre-processing has to happen to, to data sets. Uh, it has to, you have to kind of make sure that it's free of any biases. Because otherwise, when you train machine learning models on them, the first thing they will latch on to are biases. Um, I, I can give an, give an example of, uh, there's a story going around, I don't know how true it is, but um, the US Army wanted to um, uh, develop a machine learning algorithm to differentiate between American tanks and Russian tanks. Um, and uh, some professor uh, got that grant, he created the algorithm, gave it to the military, and then they came back and told the professor, it doesn't work. Here's six months of more money, you try to find out what happened. And uh, when, when he dug deep into his model, he realized that his model was actually using all the pixels in the photos that were outside the area of the tank. If the picture was taken in clean surroundings, in good lighting, it was an American tank. If the picture was taken <laughs> in bad surroundings, grainy pictures, they, they were Russian tanks, right? So th these biases are the things that it takes a lot of time to curate data. So my job was, was kind of that. I didn't do the machine learning part myself. Awesome. Great question and great answer. Um, right here. Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, you analyze the sound inside the sun. Is that correct? Yeah. So how do you hear the sound like, you know, if it doesn't travel through space? That's a really good question. You want to repeat that? Oh, yes. yeah. Or, or oh. you can repeat that. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the question is, how do you analyze uh, sounds in, uh, inside the sun? Um, so we look at the sun's surface as a whole, and we look at it with a Doppler imager. Uh, so the Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft that I talked about, one of the instruments on it is helioseismic magnetic imager. What, what it does is, is, is it observes the sun's light in a particular wavelength uh, okay. of, of the atom of iron. And when we look at that wavelength of light, it moves around uh, um, in terms of spectral space. It changes color. If it's slightly bluer, that means that pixel uh, of the image is moving away from us. If it's uh, or it's redder, it, it's moving away from us, bluer, it's coming towards us. And so the sun's surface has these oscillations. One of the prominent modes is five minute oscillations. They have a period of five minutes. So these sound waves that are generated by the internal turbulence of the sun, they propagate throughout the sun. And by making these observations, we call these Doppler grams of how the sun's surface moves up and down. Uh, you can do a mathematical analysis of sound modes on it and find out how sound is propagating from here to there. This is very similar to how we know the internal structure of the Earth. We study how much time it takes for earthquakes that happen here to reach in Hawaii, in Atlanta. And by uh, tracking the speed of sound waves throughout the Earth, we can uh, understand how dense the Earth is inside how much of it is magma, how much of it is outer core, inner core, um, and stuff like that. Thank you. Great. Um, so before we get another question, um, there's actually a very interesting question online. So hopefully uh, Sushant can um, answer for Willa. How close is the Parker Solar Probe that you just mentioned? And if it's very close to the sun, why doesn't it get just pulled into the star? Oh, <laughs> interesting. Um, so Parker Solar Probe um, it has um, crossed the Alphen layer boundary, which I think is about three to four solar radius away from the sun. Um, and it's going to go closer. Um, 
one of the challenges with with it being so close to the sun is the heat coming from the sun. So they had to do a lot of R and D on the sh shield that they created for it. But it doesn't fall into the sun because uh, it's going around the sun at a really fast rate, which creates a centrifugal force. So if you if you're turning in a vehicle and going really fast, you get pushed outside this this uh, the circle that you're trying to make. Uh, that same centrifugal force, the spacecraft velocity is kept so high going around the sun so that it balances the gravitational pull of, of the sun. And that's why it doesn't fall in. Great. And good news for us, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, right there. Uh, yeah. Okay, hypothetically. So, would some advanced civilization be able to potentially harness energy in the form of like aurora or solar flares, plasma? Uh, would that be feasible as a ground energy? Just for some hypothetical well, the, the sun's energy as a whole, especially would, would oh, uh, oh yes. to repeat, um, repeat the question, sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> so the question was, uh, would it be possible for any kind of hypothetical uh, civilizations to harness any kind of uh, energy, say, from Aurora um, or any of these uh, rare events that you, you talked about? Well, the, the first challenge with harnessing energy from these events is they are rare. And for an energy source, you typically need something that's consistent. So it would be uh, better for, if, if the aliens are actually smart, they would look at the energy of the whole sun um, instead of uh, relying on rare events which happen once in a while, right? Um, it, th that being said, when these events happen, the total energy output of the sun is also higher. So if there was a time restriction that you could only extract the energy of the sun during certain years, that you could definitely synchronize it with the um, uh, times when the sunspot number is the maximum. Thank you. And that is actually related to another question from online um, asked by uh, Veibov, um, saying what would happen if a solar flare hit Earth during a polar shift period? Well, both are rare events, but what if it just happened at the same time? Oh, what do they mean by polar shift? Oh, polar shift. So basically, you know, we have the... Um, the or it's the magnetic field fillet? Yes. So the, the magnetic uh, south pole and north pole, right? And it flips, um, you know, on a cycle, maybe like 23,000 years yeah. or something. And what happened if, um, you know, there's a solar flame yeah. trying to blast at us? That is a really, really great question. Good imagination. Um, so a similar thing uh, from, um, and I, I can give you an analogy. Mars, uh, Mars, is, Mars has kind of a dead dynamo. So the, its magnetic field is not active. It's not dipolar like the Earth. Um, it's very residual magnetic field in chunks here and there. But auroras have been observed on, on Mars. They just appear patchy. They don't appear in auroral ovals like they do on the Earth, restricted to the northern and southern region. They can happen anywhere that, uh, according to the residual remnant magnetic fields of the dead dynamo of Mars. So if uh, during the polar flip period of, of the Earth, the Earth's magnetic field would also kind of be all over the place. It would not have a single bipolar structure. So auroras could happen in patches anywhere on the Earth, depending on what the magnetic field configuration is, instead of just near the North and South Pole. Wow, that's that's really good to know. I mean, it, wouldn't it be fun just to you know observe one of those in our lifetime? Oh yeah. Uh, um, if, if, fun fact: during the Carrington event, auroras were visible as far down south as Mexico and Cuba. Wow. We just need to live in the right time and right <laughs> place. Over there. Yeah, I'm wondering what creates the magnetic fields in the sun? Oh, that's yeah, that's another question that's near and dear to my heart. Um, question so, was, um, yeah, what created uh, the magnetic fields in the sun? Right. Um, the sun's uh, sun is made of plasma. That is, that is ionized. So the electrons in the atoms are float independently of the nuclei, right? Um, and so it's made up of charged particles. It's kind of like a superconductor. Um, and 
the interior flows of the sun are such that the equator is going faster than the poles. So that creates a shear inflow, right? That's differential rotation. When you have a conducting medium that has a shear flow, uh, that tends to create magnetic fields. It tends to amplify magnetic fields. The same process happens in the Earth's interior as well. The Earth's interior is also a conducting um, uh, plasma, although it has different properties. It is more viscous, more dense, uh, because it's at the center of the Earth. And the sun's convection zone is less dense. It rotates much more rapidly, but the process is kind of the same. You need shear flows in a conducting medium to amplify magnetic fields. Great. Um, one last question from the online audience. Um, Barbara asked, are there times when there are just a lot of solar flares? And if so, are those times uh, uh, cyclical? Um, say, do they reoccur at some regularity? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the number of uh, solar flares or the frequencies of solar flares are strongly correlated to how many sunspots there are on the sun. Uh, in periods of high sunspot numbers, and sunspot numbers go through 11-year cycles, and so do the frequencies of solar flares. Uh, when you have uh, a high amount of sunspots on the sun, there could be three to five flares a day. When you have nearly no sunspots on the sun, they there could be like one flare over a couple of weeks. That makes sense. Okay, one last question from the in-person audience over there. Um, what kind of events trigger the aurora um, phenomena, or is it all kinds of solar events? And also, why do they say that it's going to be the strongest the next year and the year after? Like, we're going to see it the strongest. Um, so the question was, what kind of solar event triggered um, the aurora that we see on the Earth? Um, is it any kind of solar events? And uh, why do rumors say <laughs> um, that it's going to be maybe among the strongest, um, you know, next year and the following year? Right. Uh, another great question. So um, when um, on the sun, um, the magnetic configuration is, is such that it creates an instability and the sun kind of gives out a, a burp, which we call coronal mass ejections. Um, it spews out a lot of hot charged plasma that is also magnetized um, in any direction. If that burp comes towards the earth, um, it can create geomagnetic storms and create aurora, but not all of them do. Um, and uh, one of the factors in, which is decisive in that manner is the orientation of magnetic field in that coronal mass ejection. If that the magnetic field of that e ejection material is parallel, as in the same direction of the Earth's magnetic field, it doesn't have any effect. If it is opposite to the Earth's magnetic field, then they interact and it sends a bunch of charged particles towards the uh, north and south poles of the Earth. And that's when you would have a geomagnetic storm. What was the second part? Sorry. Oh, um, why, why is it, um, you know, someone says that it's going to be the, the oh, strongest? So maximum. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So sunspot uh, numbers, uh, we know uh, for the last 400 years, uh, increase and decrease in cycles of 11 years. And the last minimum of activity uh, was around 20, uh, 2020 uh, ish. So it's been three years since then, and we're entering that period of maximum activity now for the next couple of years. And that's why we think it will be a um, highly active period. Great, and this is actually a, a very exciting period of time uh, to also observe if you have a chance uh, through the solar telescopes, you could actually see all the solar flares um, and also you know sunspots through safe observations uh, mm -hmm. with, with solar telescopes. Um, great. Well, um, thank you. I know um, people still have questions, but Sushant will be here until the last question gets answered in person. Um, so for now, let's thank him um, for a great talk. Before we end the event, um, I also wanted to quickly just to share a couple of uh, upcoming events in case uh, you are interested in uh, joining us. Um, so, okay, well, we, while we are sharing, um, 
this lecture actually concludes the public lecture series um, for KIPAC of 2023. Um, we're not going to have another public lecture until January 2024. And in the new year, we're actually very excited to come back with a um, with multiple uh, new topics that are of uh, your interest. And at the same time, definitely let us know what you want to hear about in the future. Um, well, um, in the, so, um, well, maybe some of the sharing is not working, um, but um, November 15th, um, we are going to uh, have one KIPAC faculty member, uh, Professor Laura Sheffer, to give a public lecture um, at the Fulkio College. Um, and that is going to be on the roles of water um, in terms of uh, planetary habitability. So it's a little bit, you know, not a cosmology, but still astronomy and very exciting topic related to astrobiology. Um, and uh, in early December, we also have um, tentatively scheduled a public stargazing night at the student uh, observatory here at Stanford. So if you're already on our mailing list um, or social media, you'll get all kinds of notifications. And um, it's actually very exciting. We haven't um, done anything at the student observatory for the public. And um, we definitely want to showcase a lot of what we're capable of doing aside from the public lecture. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to um, share uh, with everybody um, our gratitude for, um, for you to come here and join us tonight. So let's bring everybody back um, onto the screen. We will be sending a um, survey form tomorrow and we would like to get your feedback on what we did well, how we could improve and what other things that you would like to hear from us. So um, this is the end of the event. Thank you again. Um, have a good night and make sure to grab some pennies before heading out. <laughs>